Oh, welcome, welcome. You have questions, I have answers. Welcome to another AMA. We got some pretty good questions today, so stay tuned. What's going on, guys? Now, before we get started, someone always asks about the watch. So this is the Casio Edifice. And little known fact, I got super into watches back when I was in medical school, which is really the best time to get into watches because you can't afford anything. So I got really into the Omega Speedmaster, first watch worn on the moon, super cool history. And since it was a few thousand dollars, couldn't afford it. So I got this, which is the poor man's Speedmaster, less than hundred dollars, chronograph, looks good, although it is quartz. All right, onto the questions. First question is, who is your hero? First person that comes to mind is Elon Musk. Now, some of you probably are getting upset that I said Elon Musk. Here's the thing, everyone in this world, me, you, Elon Musk, your mom, your dad, your friends, we're all mixed bags. No one is all good or all bad. Things are never black and white, okay? First of all, Elon Musk is a brilliant guy. One of the things that some brilliant people suffer from is when they are so brilliant in one domain, they think that their brilliance transfers to other domains without them actually having the expertise. So my buddy Rohan Francis from Med Crisis did an awesome video explaining the Dunning-Kruger effect as it relates to Elon Musk talking about ventilators during COVID. You know, I don't agree with what Elon Musk was saying about COVID and ventilators, for example, but I read this book by Ashley Vance, this Elon Musk biography. It was such an inspirational story because here's this guy who had, you know, some difficulties with his upbringing, with his father. He, he didn't have this victim mentality, right? He had these lofty goals and aspirations that many people said were unreasonable or impossible, but he made things happen. And he recruited, you know, amazing people to work with him. And together, I mean, he started SpaceX, he grew Tesla into what it is today. Just a really amazing story and really a great reminder of how crucially important it is that you believe in yourself. All right, next up is favorite vacation. I got two spots. First, after step one, I did a cruise with my girlfriend at the time, and we started off in Puerto Rico, then British Virgin Islands, then Bermuda and New York City. My favorite spot was Bermuda. It's this epic, beautiful little island. So much history, so much just, I mean, the shipwreckages, the spelunking in caves, the those berries that I'm forgetting the name of, the pink sand beaches, the snorkeling, it was, it was epic, I wanna go back there. And then the second place was Cape Town. I got this really cheap rental car from this company called rent a Cheapy, and it was this old V-dub, you know, no power steering, stick shift, you know, rolling these windows up and down with the cranks. It was just so much fun to beat the hell out of that car and then drive these windy roads, you know, golden hour, Gordon's Bay, well paved, oh my God, it was just, it was like pure bliss and I also wanna go back there. Do you miss medicine or sometimes think you could have tried a lifestyle specialty? There's two things I miss about plastics. First would be the people. I definitely got along well with the surgeon personalities and I love that they're not easily offended. You can talk about a lot of things and you don't have to like tiptoe around things or like some of the jokes we said in the OR or just amongst each other, like you can't say on social media because some small minority of people would be offended because they can't take a joke. So I miss the people. I mean, for example, I was in the OR with my senior residents and I was the DJ. I, like, I was the one who had to choose the song. So I chose Dr. Dre 2001, the album. And we're going through that. And you know, a few minutes later, Dr. Dre's rapping about very inappropriate things, dropping F-bombs left and right. And then the chair of the program walks in. And I'm just like, yo guys, cut the music. And he's like, no dude, it's chill. Like. I love Dr. Dre. I'm like, what? This is amazing. This guy is, you know, decades older than me. And I just, I loved it. I love the people in surgery. The other thing is operating. I think it's so rewarding to work with your hands and then get better at a distinct skill and see your progress and then continually challenge yourself. So at the beginning, suturing is really exciting. And then next thing you know, you're doing some, like you're using the Bovi on a kidney transplant and, and then you're like closing, you're doing half of a blepharoplasty and each time it gets more and more challenging and more and more rewarding too. As for lifestyle specialty, a very large proportion of these physicians online that have side hustles, like blogs or real estate, et cetera, they're either in emergency medicine or anesthesia. Both are great specialties for that. However, I could not see myself doing either, even though they're both great specialties. Anesthesia because, I mean, I'm just like definitely a surgeon at heart. And yeah, there's just like a lot of reasons why I couldn't do anesthesia. And emergency medicine, I mean, I did some rotations in EM and Occasionally it's cool and fun. Especially I was the guy when anyone had a lack, I'd be like, guys, just 
hit me up, I'll handle it for you because they didn't like doing lacks. Like the EMP were like, yeah, a lax, a lack, whatever. And I was like, oh, this is a great opportunity for me to perfect my craft, to keep, you know, improving my suturing skills. So the exciting times in the emergency department for me was when I got to practice my suturing skills. Do you want kids? Yes, hopefully too. What other specialty would you have chosen besides plastic surgery? Definitely something that was also surgical. You know, ENT does have some overlap with plastics, um, except you're, you're restricted to this area of the body. So I love like the intricacies with anatomy with plastics, which was included the, you know, the head, um, also the hands. And ENT has a lot of intricate anatomy up here. Um, the attention to detail, the meticulousness, I just loved all that. I also considered neurosurgery and orthopedic surgery, and I enjoyed different aspects of both specialties, but at the end of the day, plastics was just so, it was like such a good fit, like fit me like a glove. What was your MCAT and GPA? MCAT was a 40, which scaled to today's is a 525, and GPA was something like a 3.95. I essentially had a 3.77 my first quarter of UCLA. I was really upset at myself. I was like, I can do better. And then my second quarter, winter quarter, I put on an extra class just to like, I don't know, I was like extra hardcore. I then got Crohn's disease, like four weeks into that quarter, got hospitalized, was out of school for two and a half weeks, refused to skip the quarter, even though my academic advisor was like, yeah, skip the quarter. I was like, no. And then, <laughs> and then I came back and somehow pulled a 3.66 off. And then after that, I got a 4.0 every quarter, which brought my GPA up to a 3.95. How much was your whole bike setup? Bike, gloves, helmet, bike rack? My bike was 750-ish dollars, brand new. It's the cheapest Specialized you can get. If you wanna get a good bike, Specialized and Trek are like the two best brands. Giant is also a really good brand. You know, helmet was like 50 bucks. Gloves were like 30. I got the clip-in shoes, so you don't necessarily need them, but, the, or rather the clipless shoes which were, the shoes were like 150 and then the actual clips and stuff were another, I don't know, 50 or 100. And then the most expensive part was my bike rack. So on my car, I installed a tow hitch, which was like 150 bucks. And then the actual bike rack, which is a one-up bike rack. I did a lot of research and this is considered the best bike rack you can get. Super durable, like super easy to use. It was like 550 bucks, but to me, totally worth it. I know this is personal, but I could have swore you had a wife. <laughs> No, nah, man, I've never been anywhere close to being married. How to strive for a competitive specialty starting M1 without being seen as a gunner by classmates. Here's the thing, don't care what people think about you. Gunner in the truest, most purest form means someone who tries so hard and is willing to pull other people down. Never ever do that. That is a huge no-no. It's bad for you, it's bad for other people. It just never do that. Now what gunner has become is like, oh, you just try really hard in school. Look, Monica, if I cared that people are like, oh, yo, Kevin studies really hard. He's hardcore. I would have never matched into plastics. I wouldn't have done the research I did. I wouldn't have done well in the MCAT. Like, who cares what people think? As long as you're not pulling other people down, work hard. You know, I remember in, in college, one of my roommates told me, he's like, Kevin, I don't know anyone who studies as hard as you do. And I felt kind of ashamed. I was like, oh, I don't want to be known as the guy that studies too much. But in hindsight, I don't care, that's like the price I paid. And I guess in hindsight, I could have been much more efficient and not studied as hard because my study strategies in college were not very effective, but that's another conversation. <laughs> Should I break up with my girlfriend if she's decreasing my overall efficiency? <laughs> okay, that's pretty funny. You know, life isn't all about efficiency, obviously. And this guy is, is trolling with this question. It's, it's a good question though, because I do think in in my early 20s to mid 20s, it was all about building a foundation, working really hard. Yes, being efficient, really maximizing and prioritizing efficiency and effectiveness in what I did. And obviously that's not the secret to life or to happiness, but I do think it's important to get that foundation at the beginning. And then in the future, as the years progress, you can then change your priorities after you have an established foundation. Do you ever regret foregoing plastics residency? If you ever wanted to go back, could you? Nope, never had a single moment of regretting my decision. And if I ever wanted to go back, could I? Probably not because Plastics is either number one, number two most competitive, and they have so many qualified applicants, why would they take me? I quit. What do you hope to be doing 10 years from now? And Eric Zhang says, where do you see yourself in five years? Here's the thing, two and a half years ago, I thought I would be this plastic surgeon that was focused on hand and, you know, I had my whole kind of image of my life and now I've taken a completely different path. So I don't focus on this whole like five year, 10 year plan. What I can tell you is that I love novelty. I get bored easily. Hold up. 
To my future wife slash girlfriend slash partner, the novelty and boredom thing applies to you know entrepreneurship and to work. Here's the thing, when I was in med school, I was so obsessed with like perfecting suturing and getting better at that, right? I still have my suturing technique or I still have my suturing kit here and I obsessed about it and I got really good at it. And then in residency, suturing, like it became, it was cool, but it wasn't as exciting or as exhilarating because things become a little bit more routine, right? As you get more proficient at them. And then I was I was given the bovi and I was dissecting down to, you know, for kidney transplant. And then I got that rush again. I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. I only did that once, right? It didn't become routine. I did a, you know, half of a blepharoplasty and, you know, suturing that super thin skin with like my loops. I was like, oh my God, this is so challenging. I love this, it's so much fun. I'm getting in flow. But here's the thing, with time, those would all become routine. Because at the end of the day, when you are a surgeon, you're doing the same thing kind of again and again. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? But if you're someone like me who really craves that novelty and loves and cherishes that, then there's gonna be a point where, sure, you will do 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 blepharoplasties, they become routine, they're not as exciting. Same thing with the kidney transplants. I mean, in plastics, I wasn't gonna be doing kidney transplants, but you get the idea. So one of the things that I love about entrepreneurship is that there's always gonna be that novelty as long as I want to work on a business, on a project. And here's the thing, if I ever get bored of one business, I can go on to the next. So Blue Link was like my first thing. And now I'm not really as involved with Blue Link. I'm, a, I'm an advisor, you know? And now it's Med School Insiders and MEM. And MEM is like this new shiny thing and it's so exciting. We're at the early stages, we're growing this thing. It's it's cool, it's fun. And then you know what? In a couple of years, maybe like Med School Insiders is a little bit more delegated to someone else. I'm still making videos, but then maybe more of the business operations, someone else is doing it. Maybe MEM is like expanded into other tests beyond the MCAT. Maybe I'm working on something entirely new. You know, I love medical devices. That was my first love with Blue Link. And maybe I want to get back to that. One thing I love about entrepreneurship is that there's this constant novelty and growth and, and learning opportunities because one of the most rewarding things you can do is like pick up a new skill and get better at it or learn something new, right? So cooking, for example, before COVID, I could cook a few dishes and like they were okay. I wasn't gonna starve, right? But I wasn't also gonna impress anyone. But then during COVID, I said, you know what? This is the best time to learn how to cook. And I don't find cooking to be super fun, but by getting better at it and then like by impressing my roommates or like being like, damn, how did I make this? This is actually pretty good. It became more fun. It became more rewarding. And now I'm actually like, you know, I'm, I'm buying new ingredients and trying new recipes because I find it intrinsically rewarding. And you just get that so much more with entrepreneurship because Med School Insiders is a medical education company and I'm learning a lot about various aspects of business. You know, sometimes even the not so fun parts of business like taxes and things like that. And then MEM is this SaaS. It's a software as a service company. And then medical devices are completely different. And each one gives you this very rich opportunity to learn by doing. You're not sitting in a classroom you know, looking at slides, you're actually doing it. And that to me is super exciting. <laughs> I think your most common questions are about race and relationship status, LOL. You're not wrong. <laughs> when will you drop out of entrepreneurship as well? Some of these questions are so good. <laughs> all right, on a scale of one to 10, how much wreckage has all that cycling done to the genitals? <laughs> Yo, I love these questions, man. So I would say zero because I still remember we did a PBL in med school about, you know, the, I think it was like the pudendal nerve and, you know, your perineum getting numb from the compression from sitting on a saddle for so long. We, we talked about getting a split nose saddle that actually reduces the, the pressure there. Yeah, so like I took that stuff very seriously. This is an important part of my health that I definitely prioritize. And I got a saddle that has a cutout to minimize that. I also have on my other bike, a split nose saddle that's like this at the, t at the, at the end so that you completely remove all the pressure. So yeah, I mean, be responsible. You don't wanna, you don't wanna mess with that because once you do permanent damage, you know, you can get some long-term issues. What type of side hustles do you recommend for medical students? I love that question. And that is a question that I should probably address in a dedicated video. Are your parents proud of you? I think my mom's proud of me. What do you think, mom? I think my mom watches most of my YouTube videos. Why did you buy a Scion FRS? Oh, I got a great answer to this. So literally one of my earliest memories, I was three years old and my granddad taught me how to draw cars or rather I was like begging him to teach me how to draw cars. He was an engineer and I just, I don't know, I was obsessed with cars as early as I can remember. You know, even in grade school, you know, the 90s, it was the golden era of the Japanese sports cars. So I was all about JDM and drifting. Like now everyone knows about drifting. Back then, like you couldn't find anything on drifting because it was just, 
totally in Japan. It hadn't come to the US yet, but like in you know the year 1999 or 2000, I got an RC car. We put like PVC pipes on the on the wheels, and then we're you know drifting it around. I just loved Japanese sports cars. And you know the funny thing is like I thought that as I got older, I got more hardcore. But I remember even when Fast and the Furious came out. I was the one kid that was like, um, excuse me guys, like the, the inaccuracies regarding nitrous oxide and double clutching do not make sense. Like I was just way too hardcore about cars and I guess that doesn't really surprise me now in hindsight. And I was super into Initial D, right? This anime, the one anime I watched other than Dragon Ball Z and the main character's car is this AE86 Corolla, the Truno. Essentially the FRS is the spiritual successor to that car. It's light, it's kind of underpowered. It's actually very underpowered rear wheel drive, beautiful steering, very like a lot of feedback, awesome manual transmission, perfectly balanced, so easy to like control oversteer, understeer. If you want to improve your driving skill, it is such an incredible vehicle. And I don't like convertibles. So if I did, I would go for the Mazda Miata. I don't like convertibles. And also the FRS is shockingly practical. You can fold the, the rear seats down, fit your bike in there. I used to do that before I got the bike rack. When I would drive between medical school and home, like I could fit so much in the back of this thing. I'm like, this car is like a clown car. You can fit so much. So it is just such a brilliant car. A lot of people like to rag on it now because it's low on power. Look at all the car reviews from 2013, 2012 when the car first came out. Everyone loved it. It is a beautiful driver's car and I've had it for seven years. Now I am upgrading various components. I'm tracking it more often. I'm improving my driving skill. And then at a certain point, you know, hopefully in the next year or so, I will, my driving skills will improve such that I have outgrown the car and then I'll probably upgrade to something like a Cayman. All right guys, that was a lot of fun. Thanks for all your questions. If you wanna submit your question in the next one, then make sure you follow me on Instagram at KevinJubalMD. Much love and I'll see you all in that next one.